Uh, thank you all for sharing some of your thoughts. Um, I just have a little bit I want to share with you this morning about this story. Um, first, I want to give a recap of kind of where we were, uh, where we've come from in Genesis. I did this last week, but I want to continue to recap so that we can kind of follow some of the key insights that we're learning about God throughout this uh, series on this kind of origin story of the Israelite faith. So I'm going to throw this on the screen here. Um, in part one, um, many weeks ago, Christina shared with us kind of the intro to this series. We learned about God's intentions. We looked at the creation story and we saw that God's plan for our planet is really a place of well-ordered shalom, a place of deep rest, of peace, and of flourishing. And, and I, I long for that, <laughs> well-ordered shalom, deep rest, and peace, and flourishing. That sounds beautiful to me. And that's what God's ultimate intention is for our planet. But we know through the fall and through lots of human action and things that happen, um, things get pretty bad. And then in part two, we move, you know, about 12 chapters down the road in Genesis. And we see through the calling of Abraham and the promise of a son that, that we learn through this that of God's disruptive newness. Instead of sinking into despair, the faithful few were able to have hope because time and time again, God disrupted their fixed worlds with a radical newness, with new life, with fresh possibilities. And, and I long for disruptive newness right now in our story today. In part three, uh, we, we learned uh, about the, the story of Hagar and, and Ishmael, and, and we, we learned through Sarah's harsh treatment of them uh, and, and we were challenged to look into the uncomfortable mirror and ask ourselves, how have I, like Sarah, been so consumed with my own needs and wants that I've failed to see the people I've hurt along the way? We also learn that God sees and hears the rejected, the oppressed, and the victims of violence. In part four, through the story of the binding of Isaac, just a disturbing story. We learn in very dramatic fashion, actually, that the God of Abraham is different, that he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider. In part five, last week through the story, kind of just a simple story of Abraham finding Isaac a wife in Rebekah, we learn that God is busy at work, even when it seems like he's absent. And so that, that's kind of a bit of a recap for you all. And, and so right at the beginning of my message for this morning, I want to remind you of this point that I made a few weeks ago. And it's this, that Genesis is about the beginnings of the Israelite faith. Genesis is a origin story. It's a collection of stories about the origin of the Israelite faith. Genesis literally means in the beginning. It is about the beginnings of the Israelite faith. And this is important to remember because these folks who lived so long ago were just beginning to develop their understanding of God, of themselves, of their purpose in the world. And as time progresses, the Israelites grow in their understanding of God. As God reveals himself, it's kind of a progressive revelation that we read throughout Genesis. And as time progresses and passes, the Israelites grow in their understanding of God. And in all these stories, we progressively get a fuller picture of who God is. It's like with each new story, we learn something new about this God of Abraham. And so we're coming alongside of them to learn with them as they discover these new insights about God. And some of these key insights that we gain from these stories, they may not feel all that revolutionary to us. They may be like, well, I kind of know that about God. But for the original audience, for Abraham and Isaac, Sarah, Rebecca, Jacob, Esau, and so many others, for them, these truths that they learned about God would have been radical, would have been earth-shattering to them. For example, a couple of weeks ago, when we looked at Abraham and, and the binding of Isaac, he took Isaac up on the mountain for the sacrifice, and he learned in that moment that God is actually not that demanding where he would require Abraham to give his son in that way. Abraham learned that God is not like the other gods that he had known. 
this God is giving and is generous, and that would have been an earth-shattering revelation about God. So this week, as we continue our journey with Abraham's family, we're going to learn with them another radical truth about God. So let's get into it, and we can kind of imagine ourselves learning alongside them as they discover new insights, as God reveals important things about himself to them in this story from so long ago. So let me give you a little bit of context. Abraham and Sarah had both passed away. Abraham left everything that he owned to his son Isaac. Isaac had uh, it seems a wonderful wife in Rebecca. He had lots of property. He had wealth. You know, things were looking good for him. Yet he got older. Rebecca got older, and they still had no children. This is another situation of barrenness, of not being able to have children in Genesis. And, and this is the context for our passage this morning. And I'm not going to read the whole story, and I'm actually not going to get into the birthright and all that this morning. Um, and you all can get into that yourselves this week as you reflect on it. But I want to focus on the first four verses because these are really important for the entire really rest of the book of Genesis almost. And so I'm going to read from Genesis 25, 19 through 23. And so I'll put these on the screen for us. Genesis 25, 19 through 23. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian from Padam Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Abraham, or Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And the older will serve the younger. All right, and so this is our scripture for today. And, and let me kind of break down a little bit what we have going on here. In these Four verses, both Isaac and Rebekah go to God in prayer. Now, Isaac prays first, and he prays that God would give uh, them a child, would bless them with a child because they hadn't been able to conceive. And God grants them the request, and Rebekah becomes pregnant. Now, she notices that something is going on within her womb. Now, I, I have no idea what this would feel like, but the text describes that what was happening in her womb, it describes it as a violent struggle within her womb. A violent struggle. Turns out she had twins, and they weren't just hanging out in there. They were jostling with each other, as the NIV says. And scholars have pointed out that that word is not really the best word, that their struggle, the word there in Hebrew is a strong word. And it's more like they were crushing each other within Rebecca's womb. Now, Rebecca is concerned about what is going on, obviously. And so she goes to God in prayer. And I love that they both, when they need something, they go to God in prayer. That's just a small little side note, a little reminder to us this morning that we need to keep going to God in prayer. So they go to God in prayer, and God speaks to Rebecca through this prophetic oracle about her two sons. And this oracle kind of gives this prophecy about what their relationship is going to look like. And I want to read this part again because it's, a, it's an important one. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. And then that last part, and the older will serve the younger. This oracle sets the stage for the next many chapters in Genesis. This oracle is ultimately about Jacob. And that particular line, the older will serve the younger, is very important. And it is scandalous, it is scandalous that the older would serve the younger, that God would call and choose the younger instead of the older, 
is scandalous. Now let me talk about a well-established cultural norm and practice that they had during that time, and it's a word that you may have never seen before. I was not very familiar with this word, and I believe it's pronounced primogeniture. Primogeniture. Now I want to talk about this because this is an important word. This rule gave the firstborn son incredible rights and privileges just because he was born a male and born first. As Walter Brueggemann points out, primogeniture is not simply one rule among many. It is the linchpin of an entire social and legal system which defines rights and privileges. But that same practice which protects the order of society is also a way of destining some to advantage and others to disadvantage. He's saying this was not just a rule about the firstborn son getting property and, and inheritance, but it was way bigger. It defined rights and privileges. It protects this order where some had advantage and others didn't. And he goes on to say this, that primogeniture claims that some people have natural rights, which cannot be questioned. From that assumption of natural rights, a whole theory of societal relationships is derived. In most societies, that network of rights and privileges is taken as normative and ordained by God. It is the way order is maintained. It determines the criteria for justice and equity. It is a way by which social privilege is established and authorized beyond question. Now, that is a lot of words, you know, but what he is basically saying is that the firstborn son was believed to have natural rights to the estate and special blessing from the Father. And this was an important law that they had, an important practice that they truly believed was ordained by God. This was a big deal in their society. So let's go back to the oracle. Rebekah and Isaac would have naturally assumed that the older son who they named Esau, would have been the favored one, and that the younger son would have served the older. However, God speaks, and in one oracle, get this, in one oracle, God turns it all upside down. What? God said that the older is going to serve the younger? Are you kidding me? That's not how it works. <laughs> That's not how we do things around here. You see, there is an order, and there are laws that must be observed. The older does not serve the younger. Yet, God turns it all upside down. To us, sure, Older could serve the younger. Older son could serve a younger son, whatever. If the younger son is smart and works hard and is successful, sure, the older son might serve the younger son. However, to these folks living in a system of primogeniture, God's word would have been scandalous. They had their way of organizing life. And get this, God was more than willing to mess it all up. They had their way of doing things. And God was more than willing to speak an oracle, a word of prophecy to the people, and mess all that up. You know, what we're going to find over the next few weeks as we look at Jacob's story is that Jacob deals with a lot of conflict throughout his life. Jacob is always in conflict. Now, some of his conflict possibly could have been avoided, you will see that Jacob is conniving, kind of a rascal. He, he could have made better decisions for sure. He brings a lot of trouble onto himself. But much of Jacob's conflict originated with God, actually. Because the fact that God called and chose Jacob, the younger one, the one who had no right to be chosen, ended up causing lots of conflict with the family and with the community. You see... When deep-seated societal norms and practices and laws are challenged, there's always conflict. When deep-seated societal norms and practices and laws are challenged and pushed, there's always going to be conflict. 
Because the people who are kind of, they benefit from the system, they don't want it to change, right? And we see here that God is okay with that conflict that results. And that often God's calling and his choosing results in conflict, discord, and resistance. Because the powers of this world do not like to be challenged and do not want to change. I read this in a, a, this quote in a, a, one of my favorite study Bibles. It's the Renovare Study Bible. And, and about this particular passage, here's what the authors say. They say, God disrupts the way human society is organized by categories of privilege given in birth order. God subverts long-held cultural t- traditions and laws, establishing the priority of the eldest son. And I like this because the ways of God are never business as usual. That God disrupts, that God subverts this deeply held practice that they had in their society because God had something else in mind. The God of Genesis, you're going to see many times, violates the world's notions of wisdom, strength, and power. Perhaps this marks one of the first moments that God's people learn this profound truth about God, that God has no problem turning it all upside down. That God's okay with that. And he does it again in Genesis. You know, he calls and chooses Joseph. And Joseph wasn't the right choice by human standards. Think about Moses when we move into Exodus. Moses' life and, and what God called him to, to give up privilege for the sake of setting the slaves free. God chose Moses, not Pharaoh. Pharaoh would have been the powerful choice to work through the power and use Pharaoh to cause things to change, but but no, he chose Moses, and it caused so much discord and so much conflict. The prophets were called and chosen by God. They received a profound calling from God to challenge the status quo, to speak liberating truth to power, which resulted in them being despised, resulted in death, resulted in chaos. God had no problem turning it all upside down many times in the prophetic witness. John the Baptist was chosen to bear witness to the coming Messiah, to bear witness to another way of living in this world, to call people to repent. And John the Baptist got executed because of his disruption. God had no problem turning everything upside down. We'll come back to Jesus in just a second, but think about the early church, the women and men who were dedicated to the way of Jesus. When they rolled into town, people literally said that here comes those people who are turning the world upside down. And it really wasn't them turning the world upside down. It was God working through them because that's what God does. God subverts and disrupts and upsets our deep-seated ideas of privilege, power, and status. God has no problem turning everything upside down. You know, when Mary received word from the angel about Jesus, Mary, when she was a young woman, received this word from the angel about the Messiah, her calling to be the mother of the Son of the Most High, She burst into song, and I love some of the lines of her song. I love the whole song, but I want to highlight just a few lines. She says, For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. God called Mary, and she's like, God's looked at me, this humble, forgotten person. Luke 152, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. That's turning it upside down. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. She rightly understood that when God shows up, when God calls and chooses people, that a radical inversion often takes place. That what our world thinks is right and good is more often than not flips on its head. That's what God does. And that, that's what our world, and when that happens, um, we're shown that God is different then we are that in God's kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That in God's kingdom, our deeply ingrained ideas about privilege and blessing and status and power mean nothing because God's vision is so much greater. Don't get me wrong here. Jacob is not really someone we ought to follow. Like I said in Genesis, these aren't characters really that we ought to like try to emulate or be like. Um, They get things right sometimes, but they also or just making mistakes left and right. But through his story, through Jacob's story, right at the beginning, we see God's willingness to disrupt and upset our ideas about what is right and good and proper. And when that happens, when that disruption happens, 
The poor rejoice and the rich get nervous. The oppressed sing songs of freedom and the oppressors circle their wagons in fear. The marginalized are filled with joy and the privileged mourn in sorrow. The victims are filled with hope for change while the abusers try to cover their tracks. The peacemakers join hands and the violent wield their guns. Through this prophetic word from God that the older would serve the younger, we see one of the first examples in the Bible of God's willingness to totally turn it upside down for the sake of his mission, for the redemption of the ble- and blessing of the world. And this is the way God still works today. Don't be afraid to let go of things that you hold so dearly. Don't be afraid to forego privilege and status. Don't be afraid to go against the grain. Know that God is different than we are, that he turns it all upside down. And and if he does that, it's actually a good thing because that's going to lead us closer to freedom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.